Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, it sounds like I'm a lot busier than I am, but uh, alas. So a few few months ago, Jay Heeman, I'm not sure, Jay, if you're in the audience, uh, he said to me at one point, you know, in Oxford, when we find somebody that's willing to come to talk to us, we latch on to them and we, we make them come back again and again and again. But what he didn't know is that when I find a municipality willing to listen to me, I latch on and I come back again and again and again. So uh, thank you for having me here. This is uh, formally the second time I've been here, the first time for a consultation session was in August and I appreciate the fact many of you participated in that or some of you did and the results of that have now been submitted to the federal government so more on that as we come around I'm going to actually today talk to you about automobile electrification and transit electrification the reason being is that a lot of what's happening in the transit system with heavy-duty buses and the initiatives around electrification are coming out of the automotive sector and they're coming out of the policies that have driven electrification in the automotive sector. So I'm going to be talking about both of them, uh, and I'm happy to field questions. I think we have time for questions afterward. So just to give you the background, for a few of the, you, this might be a bit of a repeat, but for those of you who haven't seen this before, I want to give you the high level. Uh, when we talk about an electric car, a lot of people think about the car at the back of the room, the Nissan Leaf. That's the car I own as well. It plugs into the electrical grid. It pulls power from the grid. But when I think about an electric vehicle uh, as a public policy influencer, I hope, or as a researcher, I think about a spectrum. So the vehicle doesn't have to plug into the grid to be electric in my view, it has to be propelled by electricity. So if there is a propulsion method on the vehicle, an electric motor, a battery of any size or any sort that actually feeds power to the wheels, then I consider that part of the electric vehicle spectrum. And the reason I do that is because that maps onto what manufacturers are doing. So the big question for me, and which I hope many of us are asking is, in the future, given that we have automotive manufacturers, manufacturing in Ontario, can we manufacture these vehicles? And therefore the question should be, can we manufacture any of the parts that are embedded in any of these electrified vehicles going forward? Uh, so you can see there that I consider more electric vehicles. These are vehicles that might have a start-stop system. I wouldn't consider them electric, but they've el they're, they're electrified. Some of you may have those systems. Hybrid electric vehicles typically have a combination of an electric motor and an engine system on board. They can be diesel electric or gasoline electric. And then you have plug-in hybrid and full battery electric vehicles. I also include fuel cell vehicles in the full electric vehicle spectrum. The reason being that there's a very significant opportunity if we can harness our capacities for a clean grid, in other words, hydro-powered or nuclear-powered electrolysis to generate hydrogen. And if you can generate your hydrogen in a clean electricity grid like Ontario's, then you effectively have a zero emissions car when you pump that hydrogen into a fuel cell system. Okay, so you can see that there's a spectrum that I'm considering here as I ask myself and as I seek to research and find out, can we make these cars in Ontario and should be be trying to do so from a jobs perspective, from an economic perspective, and from the perspective of trying to keep our assembly footprint here already. Okay, so just to give you a bit of the context, um, there, if, if I were doing this presentation in Oakville, I would have changed the slide a little bit to highlight the Ford vehicles out there. But as we are here in Woodstock in the area around the Toyota heartland, I'm going to focus on the empirical picture. If you include in your picture of electric vehicles, electrified vehicles. So all vehicles, as I said, that have some kind of propulsion that is electrified, and therefore you include hybrids. Well, then in Canada, the vast majority of electric vehicles are Toyota products. And that means that you, the most likelihood of your first experience with an electric vehicle is going to be a Toyota product. It's going to be a Prius hybrid, a Camry hybrid. One of the Toyota Lexus hybrids of some sort is going to be the first car that you're most likely to see on the road as an electric vehicle. That's the case in Canada. That's the case in North America. America, and it's the case globally. So globally, uh, Toyota is leading the electric vehicle sales if you include hybrids in that understanding. Uh, this is 2014 data. I recently received the 2015 data, so I haven't been able to update it yet. The figure in terms of proportions is not that different, but what you can see there is about 60% of electric vehicles on my definition in Canada are Toyota products. Uh, that may surprise some people. If you then conglomerate this, what this shows
shows you is that all the other cars that we hear about, like the Chevy Volt, uh, the Nissan Leaf, and those fall into very much smaller slivers. Now, those are really important technologies because, of course, the more you electrify your propulsion, the bigger your motor, the bigger your battery, the further you go on electric power, the lower your emissions. So, of course, where we want to see this graph going is uh, showing us bigger and bigger pieces of the puzzle in the future for those fully electrified vehicles. Uh, but even there, as I will talk about, I believe Toyota is still going to have a significant piece of the puzzle, not only in hybrids, but they're likely to be the first manufacturer of uh, fuel cell electric hybrid vehicles. Okay, so what do we mean if we're talking about electrification of transport and why do we want to do it, whether it's automobiles or transit? What's going on in our policymakers' brains? Well, it is the sustainability paradigm, one that I think this county understands very well. From a transportation perspective, what do we mean by this complicated word sustainability? It means that these vehicles have to have efficiencies in terms of their energy conversion on board. So if I send in an electron, I have to get out a unit of propulsion as efficiently as possible. Right now, we send in molecules of carbon and we get out about 15% of that one molecule in the form of propulsion profoundly inefficient systems. If we're going to electrified systems, we are really dedicated, certainly in the manufacturing world, we need to be dedicated to a high, high level of efficiency on board. Then they need to be low emissions well to wheel. What does that mean? Well, typically, we don't actually care where our petroleum comes from. right? Uh, if we did, we probably wouldn't drive any of the cars that we drive today. So. Typically, in the history of automotive and in transit, we have not inculcated or incorporated an analysis of well to wheel. So we haven't said to ourselves, hmm, where does that petroleum come from? How far did it have to ship overseas? How did it get to my gasoline station? What's that carbon footprint? And how does that get embedded into the price of my vehicle? We haven't done that well to wheel analysis. And we still don't do that for gasoline and diesel. One way to do that may be a carbon tax, but that's another story for another day. In terms of electrification, as you might imagine, these are new technologies, so there's a lot of naysayers out there. And one of the first things that critics will say is, but electricity is not clean from well to wheel. So we know that in the sustainability paradigm, we have to prove that the electricity that we use to power these vehicles or to generate the hydrogen is clean. Now in Ontario and Quebec, as many of us know, we have a relatively clean system. We have a lot of hydropower, a lot of nuclear power, quite a bit of renewables. If you're out in Alberta, where it's natural gas and coal, it's a different story. So you do have to, as part of this sustainability paradigm, not only prove that these cars are great and that they do the job and that they achieve your goals and that you love to drive them, but that from well to wheel, they're also zero emissions. And that's, that's a tall order. Then we have to demonstrate that the electricity is locally supplied. And that's actually the easiest piece of the puzzle, right? The great thing about these vehicles is they're powered by a fuel source that is generated in your backyard and mine. All of the electricity that goes into that Nissan LEAF is generated in Ontario, which means every electron relates to a job in this province. But if I put gasoline or diesel into my car, very little of that gasoline or diesel traces back to a job in Ontario. Uh, so that's, that's a low-hanging fruit element of the sustainability paradigm. And lastly, we have a really great opportunity in Ontario to lead the world in integrating these vehicles in our smart and microgrid systems. So smart grid technologies in Ontario are world class. It is one of the only jurisdictions in the world where the entire electricity grid system, in theory, um, is equipped with smart grid technologies, which means my car and my grid can communicate so intelligently that I don't even have to think about it as a consumer. Like my Nest system at home, my car is going to turn on and off and power up and down when there's most amount of uh, green energy on the grid or when it's the cheapest for me to do so, or it should be smart enough communicating with the grid to sell power back into the grid and, hey, I get a rebate or a coupon on my electricity bill. This is what we can do in Ontario. You can't do that in all other provinces because you don't have smart grid technology embedded in the electrical grid in other provinces. So, I mean, as much as we all hate paying our electricity bill, part of that electricity bill uh, is, is the cost of having embedded that smart grid technology over the past years. We're not fully utilizing it yet, but if we did, boy, would we have a lot more jobs in this sector in the province. So, as I get to the question of jobs then, I'm just going to show you quickly, here are some of the uh, examples of electric vehicles out there. Now, I'm just going to ask you by, by show of hands, who here thinks that there are fewer than 10 electric vehicles in the world? Okay, so most of you think there's more than 10 vehicles. Okay, are there, okay, you think there's fewer than 10, right? Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you think that there are more than 20 electric vehicles. Okay, pretty good. Are there more than 50? 
the optimists in the front row. That's fantastic. Uh, there are. There are nearly 100 makes and models of electric vehicles in the world if you include hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and fully electric fuel cell vehicles. The vast majority of them are not available in Canada. So that's the first way to start shifting our thought pattern, is that these vehicles do exist. Uh, they are manufactured for jurisdictions uh, outside of North America, and they are prominent in jurisdictions outside of North America, namely China, Japan, Korea, India. Uh, so there is a rising class of makes and models, and I encourage you, if you have a chance to go to the Toronto Auto Show, these are pictures from the Auto Show last year. Every year there are more and more makes and models available in Canada. Uh, but nonetheless, the question for me is, not actually so much how many of these makes and models are available for you and me, but where are these cars being made? Because at the end of the day, uh, given my research interests and given the fact that my job is dedicated to creating job growth and economic growth in this sector, I'm not actually interested so much in, in how many makes and models you can buy when you show up to the dealership. I'm actually more interested in where are those cars made. Uh, if there are electric vehicles being made, who's making them and why aren't we making them in Ontario? Surely we have world-class capacity in the assembly lines, in the supply chain. So right now, I didn't show you the whole uh, global landscape. If I were to add in Japan, Korea, China, and India, this would look very different because there's a lot of manufacturing of electric vehicles out there. But in North America, you can see that Michigan got, got um, a very good start. About five, six years ago, they attracted a lot of the Ford manufacturing for electric vehicles. The Nissan Leaf went to Tennessee. California has the Tesla. Ontario, however, did build the RAV4 all-electric, and we still build the Lexus RX450 hybrid. This is really good news story. And as of this month, uh, Chrysler, of course, announced that it's going to be building the minivan hybrid in Windsor. This is a very good news story. The reason being that this is where automotive is going in the future. And I'd be seriously concerned if come 2016, we had no manufacturing of hybrid or electric vehicles in this province whatsoever. Having said that, it's not sufficient. So we really have to start acting as a province to move forward in developing this supply chain. So what do I mean by the supply chain? Well, you lift the hood of an electric vehicle, what's under the hood. You will, in a hybrid, find an engine, of course, and a gas tank, but you're going to find some very new parts in an electric vehicle. You're going to find, of course, an electric motor. You're going to find an energy storage device that's a battery or a fuel cell conversion device. And you're going to find a whole bunch of power electronics that are not on board a regular gasoline vehicle. Each and every single one of those parts is a job, is a manufacturing job, and it's part of the supply chain. And that is part of the world that we need to be bringing to Ontario. Now, the areas would be electric motors, power electronics, batteries, capacitors, embedded software, light weighting. Lo and behold, in Ontario, we actually already have companies active in all of these spaces. Currently, however, I, I would argue, and I do argue at the provincial and federal level, that it's uncoordinated. So if you try to find who are all the automotive parts manufacturers in this province? You can go to databases with Industry Canada, and there are actual codes that will tell you there are 400 automotive parts manufacturers. Those codes do not include companies that work in these spaces. In other words, nobody has a database in Ontario or in Canada that tells them how many companies and how big are those companies that work in these spaces. It does not exist. It is currently a gap in the North American uh, Industry Code Index, and it's also a gap in the general public policy knowledge. So if you are the prime minister of the country or the minister of economic development, or you're the premier of the province or the minister of economic development, for you to be able to make a policy about manufacturing in this landscape, you have to first and foremost know who is doing what in this area. And we don't even have a database that tells us that. Hence my research for the last two years, uh, as I've been trying to collect information through interviews, through mining of databases, and through using the stats we already have available to us, how many companies work in these spaces? Because these are the spaces that over the next 35 years are going to define transportation manufacturing. I have discovered, uh, based on my first kick at the can over the last two years and my first couple publications, found well over 150 companies in Canada the bulk of which are in Ontario and a smaller clustering in Quebec that work in these spaces. And I've also found, and I'm going to get to this, that the taxpayer federally and provincially has pumped about half a billion dollars into innovation in this sector so far. So I'm going to come back to that in a second. 
what that should tell you is that we are active in this space. We haven't coordinated it. There's no single one-stop shop where public policymakers can go to figure out exactly who's doing what. But it would be possible to establish that kind of portal. And if you were to establish that kind of one-stop shop, here it is. These are all the companies working in this space, and this is how many jobs they represent, and this is their economic impact. If we did that, boy, oh, boy, is that a really good way to start attracting foreign direct investment, because automotive companies are looking to invest, and they are looking to build, and they are looking to expand. We need to make sure that Canada is one of the first ones that they look to going forward, and we won't achieve that goal if we consistently present ourselves as only active in traditional automotive. So now I'm going to reverse in the, in the second half of my presentation and simply explain to you why I believe we even have electric vehicles to start with. So I've told you the story in terms of manufacturing. I'm going to come full circle to that. But there is a really good question. I mean, why do we even have electric vehicles? And and I would argue it is not because somebody woke up one day and thought these are great technologies. Okay, electric propulsion has been around for decades and decades, certainly since the 19th century. Nobody woke up and decided, I'm going to do this. It was not Elon Musk who woke up and said, I'm going to create an electric vehicle paradigm. That is not what happened, I would argue. Uh, it's also not because people woke up and said, goodness, the smog in the air is so terrible uh, that we will only mandate electric vehicles. So it wasn't so simple as one jurisdiction making this decision. I would argue that if we're going to be nitpicky, uh, there are multiple variables that have resulted in us having electric vehicles today. But there is one single-handed largest policy driver that I would argue North America and Europe has resulted in electric vehicles on the roads today and will continue to drive the innovation of these cars. And it is the CAFE standards federally. Now, if you want a name to that brand, I would say there's two words, Barack Obama. So if we want to understand why do we have electric vehicles in North America today, in 2016, exactly. Why were these cars innovated to start with in about 2008, 2009, coming out of the 2000s? I would say that the pinnacle point really was Barack Obama's presidency when he announced and got a dozen automakers together to agree to the most recent iteration of the CAFE standards. These standards have been around for decades, but since the 1970s, they've been around as petroleum independence technologies, right? So they were a way for us to, uh, through policy, to try and get the United States and then Canada off of oil dependency from the Middle East in particular, during the period of the OPEC oil crisis in the 1970s. But over the 1990s, they stagnated. In the 2000s, they were debated and lobbied and argued over by automotive companies and by public policymakers that had an environmental twitch. And by 2011, they became Barack Obama's climate action strategy. So this shift from being an energy policy to being a climate action strategy is really what solidified the CAFE standards. Now, what do the CAFE standards do? The CAFE standards basically tell automotive companies you need, to, you need to achieve a certain emission or a certain fuel economy or you're going to pay a fine. Okay, So that's how CAFE standards work. They're penalty structures. Since the 1970s, the whole idea was we're going to establish a standard. If you fall under that standard, your automotive company pays a certain fine. And they are fleet-based, right? So across your entire fleet of sales, you can sell some SUVs and trucks, but you have to sell some really small cars to make up for it, right? That's how CAFE standards work. Uh, in the 1970s, this graph, which which is a little bit uh, grainy, what it demonstrates is that from 1978, when these things really came into play, they start to be talked about in 1973. Not surprising for those of you who were around at that time, OPEC oil crisis. 1978, um, just before the second OPEC oil crisis, these things come into play. And if you were to study this map, what you would see is that slowly GM, Ford, and Chrysler started to align their fuel economy with the standards. In other words, it worked creating a penalty structure that forced automotive companies to become more efficient in their engine technologies to develop lighter weight vehicles to design smaller engines worked. And up until the late 1980s, you saw an alignment between the standards and the automakers, which hadn't existed before. Uh, I have another graph. I don't have it here today. But what you see is, therefore, that GM, Ford, and Chrysler in particular started to produce the most efficient cars they had ever produced because of that federal legislation. Now, I personally don't think it's sustainable to only use the top-down legislation of do it or we'll penalize you. There have to be other reasons for why auto companies are doing this. But there is no doubt that that top-down structure 
structure worked. Uh, in the late 1980s and 1990s, when the price of gasoline tanked, it became very cheap. Consumer demand was there for large vehicles. And large vehicles were hugely profitable. It's where we got the minivan. It's where we got the SUV, that era of 1990s. Uh, then there was severe lobbying to restrict the CAFE standards. So if I showed you the graph after this, what you would see is a flat line. Essentially, federal policymakers in the United States decided that they were going to flatline the CAFE standards. And it was not until 2010 that we got another round of CAFE standards that actually forced any kind of emissions reduction. So there was about a 20 period lag, a 20 year period lag where cars got bigger, more polluting, and less efficient. Now, Circa 2011, you had this new president, Barack Obama. He got together 12 automakers. They essentially discussed, in the context of a recession, how to drive forward fuel economy. And where I would give a lot of credit is the fact that the recession created a lot of opportunities. It created a lot of desperate auto companies. Uh, and those auto companies were very willing to agree to these emission standards in 2011. The emission standards in 2011, take us all the way to 2025. And what do the 2025 standards determine? They determine that cars basically have to double in fuel economy over 2012. What does that mean? Uh, does anybody here drive a Yaris? No, Ford Focus. I like to use these little cars. Anybody drive a little car at all? No. <laughs> OK, so we have some people who drive little cars, uh, subcompact economy cars. According to the CAFE standards, based on 2020, 2012 model, your car, if it were built in 2012 or before, has to double its fuel economy. It has to go twice as far on the same gas or the same distance on half a tank of gas. But that's extraordinary. But now, What's also new about the 2025 standards is that for the first time ever, they bring in minivans, SUVs, and trucks. So up until really this Barack Obama iteration, trucks, SUVs, and minivans were never part of this. Uh, and you can imagine that not only did emissions stagnate, they worsened in those large platform vehicles, which means if you are a manufacturer of trucks, SUVs, and minivans, you have to go even further to reach these standards. You don't have to double. You probably have to triple your fuel economy uh, to achieve the fleet-wide standards by 2025. Well, if you've studied any physics, uh, thermodynamics or electromagnetism, you will well know that there are physical limits to what an engine system can produce. And ultimately, car companies are hitting the wall on engine systems. There is simply no way to get to the 2025 standards without electrification. And that is where you hear uh, CEOs like Sergio Marchoni at Chrysler talking in the news about the cost and his concern over the high cost of innovation. This is what they're talking about. It's not just connected in autonomous cars, it's the high cost of converting what auto companies are really good at doing, which is building engines based on gasoline and diesel, and converting that in your assembly plant into electric motors with electromagnetic batteries. But that's a complete conversion of what you do, and you really only have nine years to do it. Uh, an extraordinary pressure. As you might imagine, last year, if you heard in the news, was one of these top sales years for automotive. We've completely come back from the recession. People are buying cars like there's nobody's business. Um, and in this period of profit, surprisingly, automotive companies, or not surprisingly, have returned to the federal government in the United States and started to lobby against CAFE standards again. So in 2011, in the wake of the recession, there was an agreement that we could achieve these emission standards. It's where you got the next generation Prius. It's where you got the Chevy Volt. It's why the Nissan Leaf came to town. This is where these car companies cropped up. It's where Elon Musk found his footing, these CAFE standards. For, fast forward five years, profits are being made on really large vehicles, large platforms, the very vehicles that are going to be the toughest to innovate because they've been the slowest to innovate in the last 20 years. And suddenly car companies are very quick to say that actually the CAFE standards are not reasonable, that they have to be brought down. This is where I would say the fight's going to be fought out. Now, uh, this graph, what it shows to you is Based on footprint, the new CAFE standards say, depending on how big your car is, this is how much you're allowed to emit or your fuel economy. This graph, what it shows you is uh, miles per gallon, so it's American, you have to think a little bit in reverse, and footprint. Uh, so the bigger your car is, the more you're allowed to pollute. But nonetheless, if you look at the lines going forward uh, all the way out to a very large vehicle, you can see that uh, Essentially, these cars have to pretty much double or more than double their fuel efficiency to get to the 2012 standard. And the red dot at the top is the Prius as of 2012. Well, what does that tell you? If I can add some interpretation to this, 
The Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, which is part of the, one of the two organizations that puts together these standards, did a study in 2012 and said, okay, we've approved these standards. Let's do an assessment of all the cars in North America today that are sold. How many of the cars in 2012 would actually meet the 2025 standards? And what they found was fewer than five models would meet the 2025 standards. All of those models, there were four of them, were either hybrids or the electrics. So the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Volt, and the Prius technology. That, that's a pretty big wake up call, that with 13 years to go, only five of hundreds of models in the North American landscape could meet those 2025 standards. So you can imagine what pressures auto companies are under right now, what stress they're under, whether you're GM, Ford, Chrysler, Toyota, Honda, you are under a lot of pressure to innovate. And perhaps the Volkswagen scandal becomes a little bit more understandable in that light, given these extraordinary pressures to innovate and given that Volkswagen chose to go the diesel route rather than electrification, right? There's a lot hanging on these things. Uh, the penalty structure by 2025 essentially becomes so weighty that if you're a car company like Chrysler and you don't have a lot of room to move right now, uh, it's not only going to take a bite out of your profit line, it may very well take a bite out of your corporate sustainability, your ability to survive. So car companies are looking in the future and seeing a bleak future if they cannot innovate rapidly. Uh, this, this graph, what it shows you is the reference case. In other words, if CAFE standards stopped at 2012, so if the standards that existed up until 2012 stopped, you could see where the emissions would go with the black line. But if we followed through with our 2025 standards, that's where the emissions would get the top line. In other words, we'd get way more fuel economy. That's what that graph is showing you. And my argument, and the argument of a lot of people in the EPA and the federal government in the US, and in Canada, I think now, post-November, uh, is that essentially the 2025 standards aren't good enough. We have to go even further. So let me put that in context. If I drive, let's say, a Toyota Yaris or a Ford Focus, a car about that size, I, I typically use these models because they're easy for people to conceive of. Uh, those cars typically right now in lab get about six liters per 100 kilometers. Okay, I say in lab because when you drive on the road, you actually are not that efficient, which is another story and how we should change our efficiency uh, tags, right? But let's say in the lab is pretty much how you drive on the road. You're going to get about six liters. To meet 2025 standards, you have to get four in that same car, that same size. The only way you could do that is electrifying or hybridizing. If we go beyond 2025 standards and we make that same car go below four liters per 100 kilometers, we get it to three, to two, to one. The only cars that achieve that are plug-in hybrids, all electrics and fuel cells, where the hydrogen is generated in a clean grid. So that should tell you, I mean, just how extraordinary this kind of innovation is gonna be. The other day I had to rent a car and it was a Nissan something, SUV something, sorry, a Tucson, I think that's, is it a Nissan or Honda? I can I remember. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I block it out of my mind because it's an SUV. But so I had to drive one, and that's what they had on the lot. And I drove it, and I said, "Okay, I'm going to look at this efficiency rating." You know, they tell you 18 liters per hundred kilometers, 20 when you're driving slow. So at least that's some feedback. And at the end of my trip, because I use cruise control and I try and stay very stable, I'm a good electric vehicle driver. Uh, I had achieved 10 liters per hundred kilometers. And the person in the car with me said. Wow, that's pretty amazing efficiency for this car. And I thought to myself, wow, we are going to die. I mean, climate change is going to kill us if the best that we can do is 10 liters per 100 kilometers. That's brutal. Uh, basically, by 2025, this car of this size has to get down to about 6 liters 100 kilometers. Uh, and you're, you're, you're telling me that everything's hunky-dory. It's not hunky-dory. There are a lot of panicking CEOs in the automotive sector right now. So take that CAFE standard. Now take a couple of the really advanced United States. There are about 10 of them led by California that have also launched the zero emissions vehicle mandate. Uh, California has the legal right by its constitution to set emission standards. No other state in the United States has that legal right. But by the constitution of the United States, other states can follow another state. So if California sets it, others can come on board. And that's what's happened here. California set something called the zero emissions vehicle mandate and a bunch of other states have followed on. In Canada, Quebec is the only province that seriously discussed joining that league. What does the zero emissions vehicle mandate do? On top of the CAFE standards, it says you have to sell so many electric vehicles or you're going to get hit with another fine. Well, up until, um, and this is just a list of some of the cars that have been made just for those markets. That's what we mean when we say ca uh, compliance cars. They're cars that were just made for those ZEV states, and they're made to be sold there so that the car companies don't pay the penalty structure. One of them was made here in Ontario, the RAV4 All Electric, and shipped off to California and a few of the other ZEV states. Uh, so, interestingly, 
this has resulted in innovation, sort of immediate innovation. We have to make these cars or we're going to be hit with huge fines in some of the US's biggest car markets. But on the flip side, it's also resulted in some innovation that's not sustainable, right? It's created cars like the Fiat 500 electric. It's, a, it's an okay car, but it's not particularly a great car in terms of what it should be able to achieve. Uh, so a lot of the auto companies would argue, and I would agree, that the ZEV mandate has pushed forward um, panicked innovation, but it hasn't necessarily supported the development of long-term innovation in this field in a way that's going to drive down costs and make these cars affordable for you and me. But nonetheless, the ZEV mandate is, is a scary thing, and therefore, insofar as it exists in 10 states, and insofar as it's not going anywhere in those states, it's only set to get more stringent, we need to make sure that as an auto manufacturing jurisdiction, we can make cars for those states. And you can see here what's going on. Up until 2017, the ZEV mandate was a little bit more loose goosey It allowed for cars that were compressed natural gas. It allowed for cars, uh, if you go to the auto show, you may see something called PZEV. Does anybody know what PZEV stand for? No, it stands for partially zero emissions vehicle. It is no such thing. It's a gasoline engine car. Uh, it is PZEV because it has a start-stop system, or it may have some other electrification of an auxiliary system. In my view, great marketing. Boy, did, did auto companies get away with something there. So they were allowed with PZEVs in, in the ZEV mandate before. Starting 2018, none of that's allowed. The only cars that gain credits are plug-in hybrids, fully electric, or fully hydrogen fuel cell, which means if you're a car company and you don't achieve those ratios in your marketplace, you're paying fines and penalties. Uh, that's a lot of money off the bottom line. Okay, so if that's the landscape, then what can we do in Canada? We can certainly make these vehicles in some of these systems, and that's not pie in the sky dreamy. Uh, what I've done is map out all of the federal programs that have taken tax dollars and put money into some of these projects. So one program is the AIF, the Automotive Innovation Fund. That was the billion dollar fund that's still kicking around. There's about half a billion left in there. Um, but that's where Toyota, Linamar, Magna, they got some of their money for advanced systems. That's where money for the Lexus Hybrid came from. So some of your taxpayer dollars and mine have gone into these assembly plants to get them ready for global platforms, advanced transmissions, lightweight systems, and electrified vehicles. Then I looked at the APC. That's the Automotive Partnership Canada Grant. This was created in the height of the recession, largely on the request of automotive companies with universities like McMaster, Waterloo, the automotive universities, Windsor. And this program lasted for five years. Uh, I know it's uncouth these days to say the federal Tories did anything for manufacturing, but they did. This was a Tory strategy. This was definitely a conservative strategy uh, to show that they were doing something for automotive. Uh, and insofar as it lasted for five years, money was pumped into this sector. Uh, and so this program had 185 million dedicated to automotive technologies, primarily electrified automotive technologies. Now, uh, that means that pretty much if you go through the country and you find a small company or university that has some capacity in electrified transportation manufacturing, more likely than not, they got money out of this fund. So there's a direct link to this fund as a node and a nexus. What's the problem? The problem is last year, the government chose before the election, so this is still the outgoing uh, uh, conservative government, they chose not to renew it. And they said it was a five-year project and it came to an end and there's no renewal. Why am I concerned about that? I'm concerned because we have all this great capacity that was invested in by you and me, our tax dollars that helped build up some of these companies and helped graduate some great PhDs in these fields. And now there's nothing. There's nowhere for these companies to go for the next step in helping innovation. Okay. Then I added up, uh, and I'm just going to come back to that in a second, I added up the final program that I focused on, that's the Sustainable Development Technologies Canada program that still exists. Uh, this program continues to fund sustainable technologies. The yellow dots are all the electric vehicle programs in southern Ontario that have received money out of this federal fund. So. If I look at the universities, these are all the universities that out of those three funds, uh, well, two of them, received some money in the last five years to do electric vehicle related innovation. That's a lot of capacity. And what does it add up to? It adds up to just under half a billion dollars of tax money that has gone into these companies. If you add in the amount of money the companies put into the projects, then we're looking at an investment of over a billion dollars. That's not, that's not uh, negligible. That is enough 
to be able to say Canada has a cluster of innovation in this sector, and if we targeted it with good provincial and federal policy as a manufacturing strategy, we would be able to attract automotive manufacturing and parts manufacturing in this sector, or help the companies already here to grow and generate jobs in this space in the future. And we would do that on the very good basis that the CAFE standards and the ZEV mandate are not going anywhere anytime soon. So these cars need to be made, they need to be made somewhere, and they need to be sold in North America. What a better opportunity could exist, I don't know. Uh, it's a fantastic conglomeration of, of opportunity. Now, I think, uh, I'm just going to ask you for a time check there, Chris. I think I... Okay, so we want to leave a couple minutes for questions. So I'm just going to end then on a note of what I'm trying to hopefully do in Oxford County. Uh, my role is on transit. Uh, so I do the automotive research and also the transit research. Take everything I just said about automotive and stick it in a bus, and you have a whole world of complicated variables to deal with. Number one, uh, individuals don't buy buses. I mean, some of you might have a bus somewhere, I don't know. But usually it's a fleet that buys a bus, right? So you don't buy one bus, you usually buy a fleet of buses. And when the TTC goes to buy buses, they buy hundreds of buses. So when you make a decision to buy electric or go electric busing, it's not the same as you or me choosing to go for a Prius or a Chevy or a Nissan Leaf over our old Volkswagen. It's a decision about choosing a massive number of vehicles at a high cost. And by the way, you have to rip up the roads and install some DC charging en route and reroute your buses as well. So it's a massive energy transportation transformation. But if we want to get to our GHG reductions in Canada, and specifically if Ontario wants to seriously meet its GHG reductions, as stated in Paris in November, we have to electrify our bus system. Right now, they're belching out diesel pollution uh, nonstop, and frequently, they're running around half empty. So what you want to do is be able to electrify those powertrains, get rid of the emissions, and then optimize the routes using big data analytics to make sure those buses are going at the places at the times they are needed so they're running around as full as possible at all given points of the day. That may mean that you can actually take buses off the routes and provide better service. And this is the world of big data analytics that is exciting. And hopefully, with the support of some of these great people, uh, Peter Crock and David Curry and Jay Heeman, we can make sure that we've got a data analytics hub here in Oxford to be able to do that. On the propulsion side, one project that we're looking at is what I call the Great Ontario Bus Demonstration. And I'll end on this. If you look across North America, uh, there are very few places that have electric buses right now. It is for those reasons. It is because the electric bus is a million dollars, a diesel bus is 300 or 250,000. Uh, it's because you have to rip up the roads. It's because Nova Bus and New Flyer and BYD, a Chinese manufacturer, don't manufacture the same kind of bus. So if you go and buy one of these buses, it's not like a diesel where you just use any diesel nozzle to fill up your tank. You have to buy the charging system with it. And imagine you go and buy these expensive buses and these expensive charging systems, and then you can't plug and play in the future and swap out with other manufacturers, now you're stuck uh, with one manufacturer. So there's a lot of problems there. Uh, and when we've gone across Ontario to figure out why aren't transit operators trying to do this on their own, as though that's not self-evident already, you know, what, do you, what are your problems? Why can't you do this on your own? We get those reasons about financial cost. But then in addition to those reasons, we get concerns about the safety of technology bedding. Basically, if you are a small operator like in Woodstock, you, you have to take a huge risk that you're betting on the right technology and you're looking around and nobody else that has this on their streets. So it's really hard for you to judge what is a best case practice. So it's a classic consortium problem. Everybody needs it. Nobody can afford to do it on their own. Nobody wants to do it on their own because they're afraid of getting it wrong. There's safety in numbers, so if we all do it together, maybe there's less likelihood of us getting it wrong altogether great consortium problem. Uh, to help co-finance, you bring in the public policy stakeholders, you bring in the manufacturers, and this great Ontario bus demonstration now includes among the stakeholders, um, Brampton Transit, York Region, Durham Region Transit, Oakville, now we're talking to TTC, and recently OC Transpo, and I know the good folks at Woodstock are well aware that I'm, I'm trying to bring them into this project, and I know they're well aware of the interest in engaging. The whole idea of this project is that we would get bus manufacturers 
drivers like Nova Bus New Flyer who want to get their buses on the road. They make electric buses in Canada. This is an example made in Quebec. The, the New Flyer one that's at the Winnipeg airport charges overhead, made in Manitoba. Uh, they want these vehicles on the road. So the idea of this project is we ask those manufacturers, how valuable is it for you to get your buses on the roads of Ontario streets? If it's valuable to you, then how much can you chop off the price of your vehicle so we can get these vehicles on the road in a demo? And then we go to ABB and Siemens and we say, how valuable is it to you to get your charging systems and your software onto Ontario roads and be the first in the marketplace? If it's valuable to you, then you're going to knock off some of that price on your installations. And then we say to transit operators, how much are you spending on your diesel buses right now? And what's your refurbishment cost? And could we shift some of that financing to offsetting the cost of electrified vehicles in a demo? If you get all these pieces of the puzzle together, lo and behold, you can come up with a massive demonstration project where you get 20 to 30 electric vehicles on the road at half the cost it would have costed to go at it alone. And you also get the weight and the ability of a consortium to hold manufacturers to account. Because manufacturers are trying to sell these vehicles, and that's great, but they're also selling them on the basis that they operate great, never need maintenance, that they'll never cause a problem. The last 20 years, the batteries will be unproblematic. So if you're selling that, you should be able to prove it out in a demonstration. And that's certainly what we've tried to set up here. In my view, I don't know that there's any other way that Canadian transit operators are going to get to the electrification picture without consortium-based efforts. It, at this stage, it's too costly and too risky, but if we do them as consortium-based efforts, then that cost and that risk come down drastically, and we actually enable zero emissions transit buses on our routes. So that is uh, one project that we are doing at Qtrick, uh, which I'm very delighted to try and rope Oxford County into, uh, because we have to be able to demonstrate that this works on small routes in small municipalities, as well as big routes in big municipalities, because of different consumer demand, different ridership, and different behavior. A lot of young people are looking at this saying, well, I don't want a gas guzzling car, but I can't afford an electric car. And they're looking for transit solutions, so the electric bus is ideal. Um, but they're also looking at carpooling solutions mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. So in terms of total GHG emissions, how much of this has got to come from the car manufacturers? How much of this has to come from innovation in terms mm -hmm. of how we handle our public transit networks, our car sharing networks, and everything else like Great. that? Okay, so there's um, there's two questions that I'm going to pull out of out of your query. The first question is, I'm a buyer and I'm looking at the price point differential, and I show up to dealership and a Nissan Leaf is thirty three thousand, but I w I don't want to spend more than fifteen thousand on my car, right? It's a massive differential. So to put things in perspective, there's no doubt that there's an upfront premium. The reason being, you're being asked to pay for that battery energy storage device, which is still high cost. Uh, to put that in a bit of context, it used to be the case that it was approximately um, people would argue about three hundred dollars per kilowatt hour and then it's gotten down to about 150 down 200 so the price of batteries are coming down you'll see that car price come down but the bigger issue there is actually the way that we calculate how what our costs are. So we've been working with a number of public policy stakeholders, and I hope that this will eventually emerge, is that when you show up to a dealership, it is very wrong that all you see is the price that the dealership says to you the car is. Uh, it's very wrong in my view. If we're serious about GHG reductions, it's very simple to reformulate those sticker prices and say this car up front costs you this amount, but this is the likely cost cost per month of gasoline, annual maintenance, embedded in the life cycle cost of your car, this is your actual true cost. Because what we found in our qualitative and quantitative interviewing is that most people still do not calculate accurately how much they spend on gasoline or maintenance. It's like a cost that you forget about. And you know maybe you spend 60 bucks on gas, but you forget the three maintenance stops or the three upgrades you went to. And those costs get lost in your credit card bill and they're not actually showing to you the full cost. If you then compare that full life cycle cost next to an electric vehicle cost, the differential comes down. It's not parity, but it comes down to a point where you may be uh, comfortable making that switch. And just to give you uh, an early comparison, you know, gasoline's really cheap right now. I know out in Alberta it's 69 cents a liter. I haven't seen that since like two, what, 1997 or something, right? It's very, very cheap. But for gasoline per unit of propulsion to compare to electricity in Ontario, which is some of the most expensive electricity in the country, gasoline would have to come down to eight cents a liter. So I drive my Nissan Leaf from downtown Toronto to Woodstock all the time and back, it cost me $3. 
uh, that that's extraordinary, right? Because I fill up once, I fill up once while I'm here, and I'm and then I'll fill up one way uh, midway, and usually it costs me a buck fifty uh, to fill up halfway. So very very cheap as a household usage, but we don't have the ability to calculate yet because it's not shown to us when we go to buy those cars, and culturally we subsume those operational costs. Now on the other end of the picture, what you said was innovation in car ownership. Uh, so all of this is talking about electrifying the propulsion, but there needs to be a lot of innovation, and it's emerging in, in mobility centers, like city centers, around the fact that maybe we just shouldn't own cars. The reality is cars are going to get more expensive. One way or the other, either carbon taxes, cafe penalties, ZEV penalties, the fact that you're paying for a battery, cars are going to get more expensive, and they should because it is not good for the environment for everybody to own a car. I mean, that's a priori fact. So how do you get to a scenario where if we can't all afford cars, but we still all need to get around, and we still all need to work, and we need a mobile economy, then you have to engage in things like the car sharing programs. And a lot of automotive companies have gotten into car sharing globally in Europe with electric vehicles. Uh, certainly in Asia and India, this is increasingly the case to get these vehicles into people's paradigm. And we also know the millennials are not buying cars. In the the same droves as their parents. Uh, so we know that car sharing is more likely to take off, also in urban centers with condos. Those kinds of innovative policies, I think, will drive forward the emissions reduction, not just from propulsion, but from fewer people being in individual cars. Now, if you do all of that, but you still have a cruddy transit system, it's still not going to achieve our GHG redu reductions. So all of that has to happen, and you still have to do the transit piece with the full-on electrification, with the full system reform. And there, for the first time ever, we have to create relationships between utility companies and transit operators. There is no place, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody's ever experienced this, but cur currently I am working to create a consortium of utilities, of the hydro ones of the world, next to the transit operators, the Brampton Transits and Oakville's. That has never happened before because that relationship was never needed before. When did a transit operator ever have to talk to the utility and anything other than the lights aren't working. Uh, it's never been there, right? So that kind of innovation has to happen to do the transit piece. All three of those things together, and I think we will get to our GHG emission reduction. But anything less than that, and, and we will all die. <laughs> Well, won't be that serious. Some of us in northern economies might survive, but alas, you know, it will be quite serious. So thank you. <laughs>